11 point of advantage all exists for my seven group of people. And many of you may have heard about CLEAR. Um, it is an interesting study, also designed by a lady, wonderful lady named Wanda Drake, who's a fan of who had, because she's an infectious disease person and thinks that sarcoid may be related to infections such as mycobacteria, um, she developed a protocol for treatment using this combination of four antibiotics. And she had a nice report showing that if you look at skin lesions, this is a patient with it on your left, you can say that that's a pretty ugly looking leg, and on the right, that's a better looking leg. <laughs> there are some ways that we score this, but most of you in the room would agree that that's not better. You'd also agree that it didn't totally clear up, but it's still there. So there, there is some improvement. So um, the other study was a pulmonary trial where they gave it to people with lung disease and they treated patients for a total of eight weeks and then stopped therapy. And then one of the interesting things about CLEAR is that wonderfully is it that she's actually, quote, curing sarcoidosis. I use the word quote because unfortunately I still think that these antibiotics that we're using also have anti-inflammation, so they may actually be working not because they're curing the infection, but they control the inflammation. Several of you in the room have probably at one time or another been on Plaquenil hydroxychloroquine, which is a drug that's used for malaria. We use it, it works about one third of patients with sarcoid. We don't think those people had malaria. We think that they got treated because of some anti-inflammatory drug. So in any case, the problem with clear is side effects. In Wander's initial study, she was pretty hard-nosed about the fact that people, if they had problems, they had to stop the drug. And so almost half the patients had to stop the drugs because the way the study was designed, if you had any complication, and think of it taking four antibiotics for eight to 16 weeks, really hard to keep taking that well without some diarrhea, some bad day, or something like that. So that's where the problem is. So where are we now? Well, we're in the midst of a double-blind, placebo-controlled, National Institute of Health-supported trial. And I'm half part of that trial, as well as Cleveland Clinic and other places. Unfortunately, nobody in Chicago. Um, but it is a study that's ongoing, and we're over to halfway there, 71 out of 105. Actually, I think the latest number is 80. So we're pretty close to finding out how clear it's going to work. And we also have found that by modifying what we do when they run into side effects, most patients are able to tolerate this regimen. I still don't think that it's, it's good enough yet to give patients routinely because I still think that we don't understand how it works and where it's going to work, but I think this study will tell us, and hopefully within the next year, we'll know the results of that study. What else do we have? Well, anacarin, anacarin is a drug that was used for rheumatoid arthritis, very much like infliximab and adilimab. And it is a uh, works on a slightly different target. That is part of that whole inflammation, all that stuff. And this one's called IL-1 receptor antagonist instead of TNF. Okay, tumor necrosis factor, the commercials you hear about Humira, that's what they're talking about. Next to it, along the line, the chain of inflammation is IL-1. So one turns on the other. So in rheumatoid arthritis, the drugs work pretty well and they work comparably. So the question is, would they work in sarcoidosis? <coughs> well, there's an ongoing, ongoing double-blind placebo-controlled trial, and I think there are a couple sites in the Chicago area that are ongoing the study. It's, a, it's just starting up. It's been ongoing for the last about four, uh, actually about eight months. Uh, we're still having a problem getting approved by our uh, the lawyers at our place, but uh, I helped design the study, and I'm very enthusiastic about the study in freedom. I think it will be a study that will tell us information about the drug and tells a lot about sarcoidosis. So it's out there. And there have been, unfortunately, no reports by a group of doctors giving it for sarcoidosis. So I have no preliminary data like we did with, say, the skin lesions with patients with lupus cornea treated with infliximab before we did the trial. So it's out there, not yet ready to go. What about repository corticotropin injection? Those of you who are paying attention, this is actually a drug that's been approved for sarcoidosis. It was approved in 1952, um, so uh, been out there for a while. Um, it is much more expensive than the other approved drug for sarcoidosis, prednisone. And a lot of people thought that this drug, still think that the drug works the same way. It's a shot, you give yourself twice a week, and maybe all it does is it increases your curing. Not clear that that's the case, but um, where we are right now is this drug is actively being studied, again, for sarcoidosis. There are two studies that have been published that I've been involved in both of them, so um, freedom of information here. The first one was a retrospective study I did with the University of Alabama, Joe Barney, and 
he and I combined the patients that we did the study is treating in our place. And we had about 45 to 47 patients that we had placed on this drug. But we know that it was about 35, 40% of them stopped the drug in the first few months. We're just trying to learn how to use the drug, how much we should give and that sort of thing. And I'll come back to how much we should give, which is a major issue. But if you got past three months, we had an interesting thing happen to them. They could get better, or they could get worse, or they could stay the same to get off the prednisone. And this is the criteria that we used for how they did. This is what happened to the patients, as I said. About 30% of them uh, had to stop within three months. But if those who stayed on, if you look at the right part of this thing, um, about a uh, 40% actually got better. About 55% were able to get down on the prednisone significantly. So there were only a couple people who didn't respond. So this is an interesting drug, it's a quite expensive drug, but it looked to me like a drug that's maybe an alternative to something like infliximab for those who can't get it or can't take the drug. So we went on and further did what's a prospective trial, and we looked at the two doses. So there's two doses you could give, and we looked at the lower dose versus the higher dose. In the 80s and the 1950s, you said use 80, and we realized now you can probably get away with about half as much drug. And what we found is that if you look at this as the results of that study, you could get the dose of prednisone down, so people were taking less prednisone, which is always a new thing, and you could improve their pulmonary function test, and more importantly, they felt better. And this is the instrument that we use called the King's uh, uh, Quality of Life Instrument. So this is encouraging, so we managed to convince the company that we need more data. So this is also a recently launched trial, which is a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, which I know a couple of sites in, in uh, Chicago are involved with, uh, for looking at whether RCI is an alternative for third-line therapy for complex therapy. And so again, hopefully within the next two years, we'll know how that works. What else? Well, the Germans looked at a basal active intestinal peptide, VIP, which is an interesting, very safe drug, actually fairly cheap. Uh, it's been around from the 50s, um, but it, and that's part of the problem. There's no pharmaceutical company developing it. They did a study that they gave patients, this is an uh, inhaled agent, almost 10 years ago they published a paper on this. And what they showed was the patients tolerated the drug pretty well. Unfortunately, they didn't show any improvement and changes in the breathing test. But they did show that they were modifying the immune response. So it raises the question, if you kept giving the drug for a longer time, not just uh, 8 to 16 weeks, but you know, maybe for 3 to 6 months longer, maybe we start to see something. Remember, methotrexate, which we keep bringing up as an effective drug, one of the things we learned early on is it takes up to 6 months before you really start seeing how it works. So if you say it only worked, didn't work in a month, that may just mean it didn't treat it long enough. With it. So in any case, where are we with VIP? We moved to Weinheim in Germany is uh, pursuing doing another double-blind placebo-controlled trial of this drug, but that's where we are. So again, some of these are available, some of them not, kind of interesting, but to give you a feeling that there is things out there that people are talking about. Well, this is another available drug, a drug called Rituximab, and a couple people have mentioned this, the cardiologists are using it, occasionally they use neurologic disease, it's an interesting drug. It's a drug in our clinic that we started using because my wife is an oncologist, uses it a lot for certain uh, patients. It is not a chemotherapy. It's a drug that works by modifying one uh, inflammatory cell, uh, a B cell. And it has been shown to be useful in rheumatoid arthritis patients. So we first used this in a patient who had bad inflammation around their eyes. By the way, the pictures I show of patients they're looking at you and stuff like they've all signed consent to allow these to be distributed to the um, for those who care and it. They, um, this lady was particular on 60 milligrams of prednisone to never get down in the dose. She had previous concerns because she had a very high genetic risk for having cancer and therefore would not take infliximab. And she felt much better taking infliximab. We did a study with the dearest Spice when she was at the University of Chicago. She's now at the University of Illinois, Chicago. But I think this was when she was still at UC. And uh, the deer uh, helped us get the trial. We did most of the patients in Cincinnati. And this was a group of 10 patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis. We only gave them two therapies. Uh, update. So um, we gave only gave them two, two treatments. 
And we saw the yellow was what happened to them by about six months, and the blue, and this is an improvement in the vital capacity. Just to look at this, about half the people responded to rituximab. Now, this is a relatively safe drug, and it is a drug that we can now use as an alternative to patients that we can't give things like infliximab. So again, for those of you in that third line, that box of what else can my doctor give, this is one of the alternative treatments. Well, this is another drug that's kind of an interesting one, which is Nixtee. Uh, some of you may be aware that sarcoidosis, it's always been the dirty secret, is that people who smoke are much less likely to get sarcoidosis. However, if you have sarcoidosis and you smoke, you're much more likely to have severe disease because you get a lot more of the obstruction, you get a lot more of the asthma, and bronchitis and cough. So Elliot Krauser said, well, maybe it's the nicotine. So what he has done is he started giving people nicoderm patches. He's in Columbus, and so we sent a couple of our patients up there, so I'm on this first paper. And what he did is he gave them nicoderm uh, patches for a period of time and looked at what happened to their inflammatory cells, and he could show that this did have anti-inflammatory properties. So beyond just giving them a headache, it actually seemed to help anti-inflammation. The problem with it was there wasn't any improvement to the patient. There was no improvement in their pulmonary function test. There was no improvement in their quality of life. But again, it was a very short study. It did not treat them for very long. It was a proof of concept that if you did this, could you affect the employment person? So again, another study that's about two thirds of the way through in a double blind safety control trial headed by Elliott at Ohio State University. So another one that's fairly close to where we'll be an incarnation. The next trial is a group of drugs that are called phosphodiesters inhibitors, or PDIs. These are old drugs. Um, for those who've had lung disease long enough, one of the PDIs is PD4 is uh, theophyll. For those of you who are in the pharmacology thing, there's a PDE5. Those are drugs like sildenafil or Viagra. Totally different. So phosphodiesterase 4 is a totally different thing, although they start off with the same thing. So phosphodiesterase 4, theophyll, Trentol is another one, or pentoxyphylin. And there was some old data showing that this actually helped in patients with sarcoid. And the NIH several years ago published a study showing that it was useful for sarcoidosis patients reducing their steroids. The problem with pentoxy is it really makes people have a lot of diarrhea, headache. It's a very intolerable drug. Well, a few years ago, Celgene developed a Telemax, which they now have uh, release commercially available. Well, Kuzumab is one of those commercials they talk about for psoriatic arthritis where you don't have to get any shots. It's a tablet form. And we were less enough to get a copy of this drug, get a hold of this drug to look for sarcoidosis. We chose to study it in patients with skin lesions. Mark Justin, uh, when he was in South Carolina still, and ourselves did a small trial. And we showed that there was a significant improvement in the skin lesion of this lady. This is a kind of improvement we've seen with this drug. Unfortunately, even though the pill is commercially available, it's actually quite expensive, and so I haven't been able to give it to any of my patients since we've been doing the study. Another PDE4 inhibitor is called Rifilimax. This is actually used for patients with COPD, and it helps reduce the amounts of cough and sputum. For those of you with pulmonary sarcoidosis, you may have evolved to the point that your major problem isn't so much the day-to-day -day short of breath, is that you keep getting colds, you keep getting cough, you keep sputum, you have to go on a short course of steroids and antibiotics, some of you are raising your hand. And that kind of happens. It's almost as if you have COPD from your smoking and you have to get out of your antibiotics. So we got interested in mass as trying to reduce those number of episodes and maybe also help the sarcoid. So we just completed this trial. And what we showed, this was another one of these double blind placebo controlled trials, three centers ourselves, Cleveland Clinic, and um, South Carolina. And what we found was a lot is that if we gave people rifilimax, they had less episodes of reduction in their pulmonary function tests. They had less acute episodes. So just like in COPD, it did actually work. It made them have less episodes, so they felt better, which was encouraging. The other thing that was encouraging is the patients felt better. So one of the things that we've been struggling in sarcoidosis is what is more important? At least shows you some of the things that we've been now asking patients, what do they think rather than what the physicians think? So is it the improvement of the pulmonary function test or the quality of life? So 
we have shown, I've now shown you a couple different treat studies in which we've actually shown not only do we make people have improvement from what we think of, but we're also now measuring how well it improves their quality of life, which is something you should be always asking about. So what about, I'll finish up with some novel therapies. They haven't, the other ones haven't felt to be novel. But these are ones that kind of people always ask me. Patients are constantly asking me about stem cells, uh, partly because uh, the FDA does not regulate stem cells. So that's why you hear all these commercials about why you go off and get yourself stem cell treatment. Well, stem cells can do various things. In sarcoidosis, the rationale behind stem cell is to give you a cell that would increase the control of your inflammation. Sarcoidosis patients, the inflammation is out of control. That's what the granuloma is. But one of the things you can do is you, if you put in a new cell in there, this cell can actually regulate the other ones and tell them, get back in line, do what you're supposed to do. This is what this study was. We gave placental-derived mesenchymal stem cells. This was something we did in sarcoid patients. It's also been using the same stem cells as we used in Crohn's patients. So this was a large study. This, if it ever gets approved, will be an incredibly expensive thing. They come in with their own little container of the stem cells that they ship in. It looks like RD22 with the freezer thing. It's very, very complicated and expensive. So it was in a very elaborate study. We were very concerned that this was going to make people much sicker because when you give it through the vein, the first place it goes is to the lungs, and it's going to cause them to stick in the lungs and make them very short of breath. So this was a, what we call a proof of concept. So what was going to happen to the people when they got infused with these stem cells? So what we did cardiologists like this part is we put a swan gaze catheter into them and measured their pressure, how much pressure their heart was pumping against, and whether we put them into heart failure or created a thing called pulmonary hypertension where the pressures rose because we just put all this, these cells in the way, in the blood vessels, in the lung. Well, they did rise. They rose by about three to five points, which is not very much, fortunately. And these were patients that already, some of them already had pulmonary hypertension, so we didn't really get into a lot of trouble with that. So it's relatively safe and it was well tolerated. What happened? Nothing really changed in the pulmonary function in these four patients overall. These <coughs> patients had a prolonged response, and we were able to show the stem cell state. I see Kelly's coming down, so I've got to get finish up. I'm going to finish up with the most exciting thing that I've seen in the last few years in sarcoidosis, which is the somatostatin receptor thing. It's exciting because this is a totally different way. We've talked about PET scans, we've talked about gallon scans, maybe the there's another receptor, another scan called the somatic scan, the receptor scan. And there was a group, um, I think they're in Germany, but no, Switzerland, and they realized that maybe what we should do is they, they use this somatostatin receptor to kill certain tumors. And they said, why don't we do this for sarcoid? So they loaded up the somatostatin scanner and gave it to people and act where they're taking up the tissue or taking up the activity they killed those cells. So it was a localized anti-inflammatory response. So the person on the left, that's their scan before, and it's lighting up, and on the right, is that the scan after. So all those black things in the lung, those are all gone down. You can see the head, you can see the skull, you can see the arrows, they've all kind of disappeared. So they killed the inflammation cells. They killed the cells that were expressing the somatostatin. So it's, as I said, it's a very clever idea. It's targeted therapy. What could be better? So what are the problems? Well, one is that most of us don't have the nuclear reactor in our next door that we create the somatostatin. And this, there are some other cells that have somatostatin, like all the white cells and uh, such. So the oncologist in my, my house would say, you've got to be pretty careful. And in fact, these guys harvested the bone marrow on, all these, on these two patients before they treated them. Fortunately, they did not have to give them bone marrow transplants afterwards, but they were worried about it. And so it is still unclear where this is going to go. But it is something that's a very interesting targeted therapy. So I'm going to stop at this point. Um, we'll, we have some other things we can talk about, but we'll talk about it after the break. Just tell us that I'm keeping you for a moment. So. <laughs>